Good evening. Um, thanks for being here tonight. So glad you guys are here. Um, just uh, to let you know, tonight's going to be a quick message because my iPad has 23%. So that's fun. So, um, yeah. And my sermon doesn't want to open, so we might be done. Oh, there we go. Okay, here we go. <laughs> We're about to be done super early. So for those of you who don't know me, most of you do, my name is Nicole. And tonight we're kicking off a brand new series um, on the fruits of the Spirit through the book of Acts. And like I missed a really good opportunity to call it Acts of the Spirit. So I might change all of the graphics and start calling it that. But either way, we're looking at the fruit of the Spirit uh, from Galatians 5, 22 verse, and 23. And it says, it says, but the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faith, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these things. And on reading this, we come to understand that the fruit of the Spirit is what? Yes, whatever it was all of them though. Like I'm, I'm talking to y'all like y'all have never heard Galatians 5, 22 through 23. So it's love, joy, p- patience, kindness. If you grew up in church, you had to, this one and John three sixteen. you like know them. They're, they're etched on the inside of your eyelids. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And I love the sarcasm. I read it as sarcasm. You might not read it as sarcasm, but that Paul throws in here. And he says, against such thing, there is no law. Like, you know, it's not against the law to be a good person, but it should be against the law to be a jerk. But here's what I've come to believe. And you guys beat me to the punch already because I taught about this a couple years ago. But what I've come to believe and understand is that the fruit that the Holy Spirit produces in our lives is love, period. That is the fruit. And then joy, patience, peace, kindness, goodness, all that other stuff are byproducts or outgrowth of our love. One could say that love is the root of our, anyways. Um, so, but I like to explain it like I did this when I taught on this uh, Galatians 5 a couple years ago, but I like to talk about love like it's an orange And I believe with all my heart that the orange is the pinnacle of God's design of fruit. He used all of his creative orange juices. (laughs) Like, if you don't think that's written in my notes, it's written in my notes. But he used all of his creative juices to come up with the fruit that we could peel with our hands, that it was already divided into segments. And he spent all his time that by the time he got to the pineapple and the coconut, he's like, I don't know, make this one hard on him, put spikes on it or something. But just like when you peel an orange, you go to eat an orange, and you start to divide them into segments, like I said, and you eat those segments, you're not eating just a piece of an orange, you're still eating the orange. So just like the segment of an orange, so is joy, peace, patience, kindness, and all that other stuff, a part of love. All that good stuff comes out of the Spirit producing love in our lives. And love is not just the one fruit, it is the core fruit. And without love, without love, everything else, it's not Christ-like. All these other characteristics of Christ, without love, we're not living and being like Christ. And we know the two greatest commandments. I talked about them last week, and we've talked about them a lot here. The two greatest commandments that Jesus tells us is to love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love our neighbors as ourselves. This, these, this Christ-like love for God and others includes principles of love, justice, and mercy. And when we're grounded in love for God and we're grounded in love for all people, we become Christ-like. Like I said, without love, we are not like Christ. If we go all the way, well, not all the way, but if we look at 1 Corinthians 13, which is like, you know, the love chapter in the Bible. Like, um, so if you grew up in church, you know this one too. It gets read at weddings. It's a lot of fun. But if you look at this and you pick it apart, um, you can see that all of the fruit of the Spirit that Paul talks about in Galatians is a part of love. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is peaceful because it does not envy. Love is gentle because it does not go around boasting or arrogant. Love is not selfish or self-seeking, but in goodness it seeks out the best for other people. Love is not easily angered because it is self-controlled. Love rejoices with the truth because it is faithful. Love always protects and trusts and hopes and perseveres. 
because it has joy. It is all rooted in love. In Colossians, Paul says this, since God chose you to be the holy people he loves, you must close yourselves with tenderhearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. But above all, But even above the mercy and the kindness and humility, you must clothe yourselves in love. Because if you don't have love, if you're not rooted or grounded in love, you can't have any of the other stuff. That other stuff just falls flat. Love isn't just a good quality to strive for, but it is a unifying force behind all of our kindness. Paul says, above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds us all together in harmony. And it is this kind of love that we must learn how to live out in practical ways. And for us at Refuge, what I believe this means is living out our love for God in practical ways. So we're going to be in Acts 18 tonight. We're going to start right with verse 1. Then Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. Remember last week, Paul was in Athens preaching to all the smart people and the Sheldon Coopers of the world. And he left and went to Corinth. And there he became acquainted with a Jew named Aquila, who had recently arrived from Italy with his wife Priscilla. They had left Italy when Claudius Caesar deported all the Jews from Rome. And Paul lived and worked with them, for they were tent makers just as he was. All three of these people, they were tent makers. Tent making was a trade that Paul probably learned as he was a kid because it was normal for Jewish uh, boys to grow up learning a trade. Even though he was learning and training to become a rabbi and studying the Torah and doing all that fun stuff, he was learning a practical skill because the Jewish people believed that they needed to know practical skills to support themselves. So even though He was being trained to be a Pharisee, being trained for a mission. He was also learning this practical trade to sustain himself. And it's easy to think about Paul as a full-time teacher or preacher, especially when we look at the letters he wrote, the epistles. We talked about those. Was it last summer we did the epistles? I don't know. They're on the website. If you go looking for them, we did all of the epistles. And it's easy to think that that's all Paul did full-time. But here we learn that he actually had to find a a balance between his life and ministry. He had to find a balance to meet his basic needs while also doing what God has called him to do because tent making enabled him to do his ministry. And Paul worked hard and took on practical responsibilities. And there's not much more, uh, nothing more practical than getting a job to pay your bills and keep the lights on. And tent making was hard work. The materials they worked with were not easy to work with, leather and canvas. It was thick, it was heavy, it was large. They had to carry it, cut it, stitch it, lift it. And so Paul had to be in shape, had to work hard, had to do this outdoors. Imagine making tents in Florida because you can't build a tent in another tent. That would be intense. (laughs) Look, that was a good one. I don't care. That was a good one. <laughs> but he, ded- he was dedicated to his work, and he was dedicated to being an apostle. And he was committed to living out this humility, to work, to do ministry, committed to living out the gospel, and living out these Christ-like characteristics in practicals, practical ways. Paul's love for Jesus, and Paul's love for the gospel, and Paul's love for other people— pushed him to do whatever was necessary to keep his mission going, whether it was hard work, manual labor, fundraising, managing resources, maintaining and cleaning the church, helping support or fund or volunteer with outreach programs, helping to volunteer with things that go on in the church, helping to ensure that there are means to serve outside of our walls. It is about our love for God our love for the gospel, to push us to do whatever is necessary to make God's mission successful so that the message, the all-inclusive message of grace and mercy and love goes beyond our four walls. And also in Acts 18, we see a partnership between Paul and his tent-making buddies. They were like-minded people 
And it wasn't just working together. They weren't just co-workers building tents to make a living. They had a shared mission in mind. They were like-minded and they wanted the gospel to spread to Jew, Gentile, and everybody in between. And it was Priscilla and Aquila's love for God that was their buy-in, made them go all in to work with Paul. Not just so that he can do ministry, but to make sure that he was supported And he could to keep doing what he was doing. See, God calls us to partner with one another in very practical aspects of ministry. Priscilla and Aquila are very good examples of of what practical ministry is. Just doing basic things that need to be done to ensure that the gospel gets to all people. Taking on their responsibilities, supporting one another, supporting Paul so that the message could get to all people. Loving God means that we don't have to carry our burdens alone, whether that's ministry burdens, it's life burdens, financial burdens, family burdens. Love for God means that we are a family. Love for God means that we are children of God and that we do not have to do anything alone. There is support and there is love to be found in our community. Aquila and Priscilla lived out their love for God in working with Paul, bearing the responsibility to keep the mission, to keep the message going. That meant everyone pulled their weight, whether it was financial, whether it was uh, labor intensive, whether it was volunteering or offering creative solutions, they all were pulling their weight. And for us, practically... That can look like a lot of different things. The list on how to support the ministry here at Refuge is endless. And I am a terrible delegator. I'm just going to be honest. It is not one of my strong suits as a leader. And this is, how, this is how bad delegators operate. If you've worked for or with or around a bad delegator, you this will not be a surprise to you. But we often shoot ourselves in the foot because we suck at delegating. And we suck at delegating for uh, me particularly. I don't, I struggle to ask for help. Like I don't want to put anybody out. So I don't want to ask for help. So I'll just like, you know, I don't want to burden them. So I'll just do it. Or you're not going to do it right. So I'm just going to do it myself. So I don't delegate. I don't ask for help for one of those two reasons. And so when I do that, you guys recognize that I'm not asking for help, but I still get pissed when nobody is helping me. So <laughs> just, it's just how bad delegators operate. I'm not saying it's healthy. I'm not saying it's right. I'm just saying it's what happens. And I, you know, through a lot of therapy and a lot of work, I'm getting better. But I struggle in that way. I've made a, I make sure that the people that I'm leading, they know that I'm a terrible delegator and I don't need help, but I still get mad when they don't help me. So tonight, I'm telling you that I need help. I need help because I can't do the ministry here at Refuge alone. The leadership team here at Refuge cannot keep the doors open by ourselves. We cannot keep doing, we cannot keep outreach up by ourselves. We need help. And it's not because I don't want to do all the work by myself. I'm not here saying I need help because I just don't want to do the work. Because um, if I didn't have an amazing wife who made sure I took care of myself, I would do it all by myself. I would run myself ragged, making sure that refuge stayed successful. But in the last couple months, I've, I've uh, learned, well, not learned something because I always knew it, but it's come back to light to me in my life, um, is how much fun and energizing it is to actually do ministry stuff together, actually do stuff with people. Um, and for the, a great example is the work day we did here um, last Sunday. And one, like a bunch of people showed up, which was a shock to me. Like I'm not, people were asking me what they could do and like I was not expecting so much help. So I didn't have a list of things to do. Like everyone was like, what can I do? I was like, I don't know. I was just prepared to do this all by myself. So I don't even know what to tell you. So I didn't have any kind of organization because I wasn't expecting it. But also, I almost cried because I was, it was just exciting to see people show up and catch the vision and catch the dream. To do something as simple as moving furniture around, moving shelves, reorganizing, cleaning. Like, it was, it was so cool to see. And it was, we got it done quick. And, I mean, I don't know about you, but I have fun. If you didn't have fun, I'd, 
I was running around not de- delegating, so that's why I had fun. But, <laughs> but that's a perfect example of a small thing that doing things with other people, having people support you in small things like that, it's energizing, it's exciting. And so Paul experienced this as well because we're going to keep going in verse 4. It says, each Sabbath... Paul found himself at the synagogue trying to convince and reason with Jews and Greeks alike. But after Silas and Timothy came down, Paul spent all of his time preaching the word, and he was able to testify to Jews that Jesus was the Messiah. And we see Paul's love for God. We see it in his work, and we see it in his worship. So Silas and Timothy come down, they get to Corinth, and they help bear his burdens. They help carry his load. And I don't know what um, Timothy and Silas did when they got there. I don't know if they jumped in making tents. I don't really know, but what I do know is that their arrival meant that Paul got to go from making tents six days a week and preaching one day out of the week um, in the synagogue to preaching and teaching every day, full-time, They pick up some responsibility, and the gospel gets shared full time, all day, every day. And this is why our community is essential. This is why people are essential. Coming together is important, because do we need to pay rent? Yes. Do we need to keep the lights on? Maybe. I don't know. Maybe candlelight services aren't exclusive to Christmas Eve. I don't know. I'll bring it up at the board meeting. Does the church need to be cleaned? Yes. Do kids need to be supervised? Again, I can make a case for a firm maybe. (laughs) Do flags need to be put out? Preferably. Do connect cards and prayer cards need to be in the seat backs? You know, ideally. But when we work together, when we come together, when we're working as a common, as a unit with a common mission, like-minded people, We become more effective in our ministry. We become more effective in what God has called us to do. Buying in to the vision, bearing the load, supporting your pastors. This is how we become effective. This is how we do effective ministry. And I'm not saying we as Brian, me, or David. This is we as all y'all. All y'all make what David and I do have meaning. But the thing is, is that ministry is hard. Doing any sort of ministry on any level is hard. Paul experiences this when he has some pushback, and it says, all they did was argue contentiously, and they contradicted him at every turn. Totally exasperated, Paul had finally had it with them, and gave it up as a, as a bad job. He said, fine, have it your way, he said. You've made your bed, now lie in it. For now on, I'm spending my time with other nations. And what is happening here is that the religious, the devoutly Jewish men and women are coming and pushing back that, on the fact that Paul is preaching that Jesus is the Messiah. They're pushing back on the message of inclusivity that Paul is bringing to both Jew and Gentiles. They're contentiously shutting him down, arguing with him in public. And he's, as he's trying to persuade them that Jesus is a resurrected Messiah, he was met with great hostility. He was met with people trying to stop him, shut him down. But Paul's love for God kept him moving. Paul's love for God kept him on mission kept him focused. And it should be our love for God that keeps us on mission. And what is our mission at Refuge? It is all people. Getting the inclusive, grace-filled love of the gospel to all people. And continuing the work that we've started here at Refuge is going to be hard. Ministry is very very hard. I make the joke that I work in healthcare also. I say healthcare and ministry would be very, very easy if it wasn't for the people. <laughs> I'll just anything, any job would be easy if it weren't for people. Continuing to work when finances are tight is going to be difficult. Partnerships have ended through the years. We lost a lot of relationships with different ministries that we've supported and vice versa when we took an affirming and inclusive stance. 
makes ministry hard when people don't back your vision. Ministry is hard. We often get to a point where we feel like we want to give up. And there are so many, so many reasons to throw in the towel on minist- in ministry. There's so many reasons to quit. But our love for God, like Paul, should push us forward. Our love for God is a fruit that allows us to always protect what God is doing here, always trust what God is doing here, and always hope that what God wants done is going to get done, and to never give up, to always persevere. And Paul couldn't have done anything. Paul couldn't have done what he did without his community, without his people. So our love for God pushes us to love for each other. It was their teamwork, their shared resources, the community support that made it possible for the gospel to be heard. The ministry thrived because of what the community did for Paul. Otherwise, he would have had to keep working as a tent maker, limiting his outreach, limiting his mission and his ministry. And our goal at Refuge is to rally together so that we can fully devote ourselves to sharing the inclusive grace-filled, loving message of Jesus. Just like Aquila, Priscilla, Timothy, and Silas were all practical, faithful, loving pieces of a bigger picture. Their support, their community led to something much, much bigger. I'm going to read, um, I'm going to read some, a lot, not a lot, maybe like seven, eight verses of scripture, but I want you to pay attention to them. It's in Acts um, 18, verse 18, says, Paul stayed a little while longer in Corinth, but then it was time to take leave of his friends. He said his goodbyes, and he sailed for Syria with Priscilla and Aquila. Then they landed in Ephesus, where Priscilla and Aquila got off and stayed. Paul left the ship briefly to go to the meeting place and preach to the Jews, They wanted him to stay longer, but he couldn't. So after saying he said goodbyes, he said, I'll be back. I promise, God willing. From Ephesus, he sailed to Caesarea. He greeted the church there and went to Antioch, completing his journey. And after spending a considerable time there in Antioch, Paul set off to Galatia, retracing his old tracks one town after another, putting fresh heart into the disciples. I don't know how they did this mission trip, if they saved up from all the tent making, uh, but they started to travel and preach and do outreach and spread the gospel one town after another, putting a fresh heart and a fresh excitement and a fresh love for Jesus into people's hearts. What Paul goes on to do and become in part can be credited back to what happens in Acts 18. Support from his people and his love for God and the love within his community. It was a small acts of love that resulted in big outreach and big results. Had there not been the fruit of love in Acts 18 verses 1 through 6, we might not have ever learned what the fruit of the Spirit even was. At least possibly not from Paul Because the seeds of love planted in Acts 18 blossomed into the letters and the messages that continue to guide and teach us in 2024. Small acts of love for God, love for one another, created the conditions for Paul's ministry to transcend time. And I read those passages of scripture, those verses, because I wanted you to pay attention and notice where he traveled to and from. He started in Corinth. Then he went to Ephesus, and then he went to Galatia. Do these sound familiar to you? Like, I'm going to be honest. I, like, when I was younger, I would read Acts and, like, be like, oh, that's a coincidence. Like, he was in Corinth and then wrote a letter to Corinthians. Or it it just didn't click for me. I'm not the the sharpest crayon in the toolbox. (laughs) But he started in Corinth, and he wrote letters to the church he planted in, Cor- in Corinth, to the Corinthians. He did the same for the Ephesians and the Galatians. 
not only was Paul able to plant churches in these cities, but his letters to those churches on how to run and operate and to be Christ-like are part of the canon that point us to Jesus. They are part of the book that points us to the inclusivity and the love and the grace and the mercy and the justice and the joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and gentleness that is Jesus. The small acts of love between Paul, Aquila, Priscilla, Silas, and Timothy, the support, the community, the friendship, the relationships had an influence that has literally been infinite, will be infinite. We're not in infinity, but if Paul's people hadn't been Paul's people, if Paul's community hadn't been Paul's community, we might not even have a series of the fruits of the Spirit to be doing. But they lived out the fruit of love in practical Christ-like ways. And so we get Galatians 5, and 23. We get 1 Corinthians 13, and we get Colossians 3. Their working together meant that their little bag, their little band of ragamuffins and misfits get to hear the inclusive, grace-filled, loving message of the gospel. We get to hear that message thousands of years later because of what they did, because of the fruit of love that they started to plant in Paul's life. I can't do it alone. You can't do it alone. Nobody can do it alone. We must live out a fruit of love in practical ways in our love for God and our love for one another. And the truth is, it's going to be hard. It's a little scary. You know, <clears throat> we've decided to stay. The board voted to stay where we are because we have an identity here. We have a home here. People know where we are. So it was a big step of faith to keep it all, to keep our, our home, our identity, our place of worship. And I could have at any point quit and said, this looked like it's going to be hard. I don't want to do it. I quit, and I'm going to go back to working at the hospital, and you can figure it out without me. And I'm not saying this to boast or to brag, but my love for God and my love for every person in this room and my love for people wouldn't let me quit, despite staring down the impossibility of all of it. And sometimes, I don't know if I'm walking in faith or stupidity or a little bit of both, but I'm moving forward either way. And I'm sure Paul felt the same way, if it was faith, arrogance, stupidity, or what. But I bet Paul had similar conversations with God that I've had, like, what the heck am I even doing? And so I picture Paul at home one night, just in all of his feelings, feeling everything, the stress, the worry, Screaming and yelling and crying and cussing at Jesus and frustration about the pushback he's getting, about how hard it is, about how impossible it feels. And when he's done, he's tired, he falls asleep. It says, the Lord spoke to Paul in a dream. Keep it up. And don't let anyone intimidate you or silence you, no matter what happens. I'm with you, and no one is going to be able to hurt you. You have no idea how many people I have on my side in this city. And that was all he needed to stick it out. So Paul stayed another year and a half faithfully teaching the word of God to the Corinthians. Our love for God, our love for each other, for this community, for this family, our love for outreach and other people is deeply rooted in God's love for us. God told him to keep going, not to quit, not to be intimidated because God was with him. God was giving him strength to do what God called him to do. He was giving him the ability and the power and the anointing and the strength to keep moving forward. 
I'm going to ask the band to come up as I share this last verse of Scripture from John, 1 John 4. Is that we know how much God loves us. And we have put our trust in his love. God is love. And all who live in love live in God. And God lives in them. And as we live in God, our love grows more perfect. And we love because he first loved us. The fruit of the Spirit is love. Our love for God, our love for one another, our love for outreach. But it all started because God loved us. And that's why I do what I do. That's why I want to keep pushing forward is because I believe that there are people, I know that there are people outside of these walls who need to hear about the love God has for them. The all-inclusive, grace-filled, loving God. And so as we worship tonight, as we close out, will you just tell the Lord how much you love him, how thankful you are that he's given us this community, he's given us this home, Would you ask God to continue to work in you, to strengthen you, to keep pushing forward, figuring out what your piece of the puzzle here is, how you can help support the ministry at Refuge, not just so I can keep a job, just so we can keep this building here for us to come and just us meet and that's it, but so that we can get the message of God's love out to all people. Would you stand and worship with us tonight?